So we've just looked at a whole series of protozoans, as well as four distinct groups that we're concerned with as far as human infection. And we're about to look at the helminths, or the worms. When we consider the study of protozoa and helminths, it's sometimes called parasitology. Thus, a parasite is a term used to denote protozoan and helminth pathogens. Let's take a look at a couple of protozoan pathogens before we move on to the helminths. The trypanosomes are pathogenic flagellates, and I thought it would be interesting to look at the trypanosoma genus. These are long crescent-shaped cells that have a single flagellum, and they're transmitted by blood-sucking vectors. Now, a vector is simply a vehicle for transport. So, for example, with malaria, the mosquito is a vector that infects people. We'll look at that one later in the semester. There are two particular trypanosomes that we are very interested in. T. brucei causes sleeping sickness, and it's geographically restricted to Africa. T. cruzi causes a disease called Chagas disease. It's endemic to South and Central America. That is, it's geographically restricted to South and Central America. The figure on the right illustrates the complex parasitic relationship, and it involves a warm-blooded mammal and an insect. This cycle involves a warm-blooded mammal and an insect. The insect of interest here is the reduvian bug, otherwise known as the kissing bug, due to its propensity to bite the corner of the host's mouth. This disease is usually passed from bug to mammal and mammal bat to bug, but not usually from mammal to mammal, except during pregnancy. This is how it goes. The trophozoite multiplies in the intestinal tract of the bug, and as such, it ends up in the feces of that bug. The bug then bites the host, the mammal, on the mucous membranes such as the eye or lip or corner of the mouth. In addition to biting, it also poops right on the bite site. That is, it defecates on the bite site, which thus contaminates that site with trypanosomes. The bite itches, and the individual itches the bite. It opens up more space for the trypanosomes to enter. These trypanosomes then enter muscle tissue and white blood cells. In these cells, they'll multiply. As the cells burst, they release the trophozoites into the blood. Once it's in the blood, the trophozoite is able to spread to the lymph organs, the heart, the liver, and the brain. And so it causes symptoms like fever, inflammation, brain and heart damage, and often results in death if it's untreated. So you can see here that there's a complex parasitic relationship. Not all infections are this complex. So let's take a quick look at a simpler situation. Infective amoebas, or entamoebas. There are several amoebas that cause disease in humans, but the most commonly associated one is entamoeba histolytica. It causes amoebiasis, or amoebic dysentery. This is the fourth most common protozoan infection in the world. It has a huge distribution from northern zones all the way to the tropics, and it's always associated with humans. This situation does not involve multiple hosts. All we need is a human or other single host. The entamoeba spends part of its life as a trophozoite and part of it as a cyst, but this cyst is highly resistant. It can live in the soil dried for weeks. And the primary mode of transmission is simply through ingesting food and water that's contaminated with human feces. This is why many people traveling to third world countries will come up with amoebic dysentery, is because the water and food sources have not been separated from human excrement because there's not highly developed sewage management systems. So these are just a couple of examples of the life cycles that are possible in infective protozoans. Let's now move on to look at the parasitic helminths, or the worms. Helminths is a name that's derived from Greek that literally means worms, and in this category we're interested in tapeworms, flukes, and roundworms. Now, worms are multicellular organisms, so classically they're not microorganisms, but we include them in the study of microbiology because of their infective abilities 
and because we need to use a microscope to identify the eggs and the larvae. The two main groups are the Askelminths or Platyhelminths. Recently, the title Askelminths has been changed to nematodes. Nematodes simply meaning roundworms. We haven't yet applied a more favorable word to the Platyhelminthes, but this literally means flatworms. And it's composed of two categories, the cestodes or tapeworms that you can see illustrated here, and the flukes that we see here. The top figure here is a roundworm. You'll notice that it is round in body shape rather than flattened that we see in the tapeworm. Let's take a closer look at flatworms. Again, the phylum platyhelminthes. They're thin and often segmented. The tapeworm is the classic example of a segmented flatworm. The two subdivisions that we'll be looking at within flatworms, again, are the cestodes, which are tapeworms. These have long, ribbon-like bodies. Essentially, they've evolved to be nothing more than reproductive segments. They have a head with a scolex for attaching themselves. You can see this apparatus here. And then the rest of the body segment is simply reproductive packets. These segments can break off and release eggs out of the environment to complete the life cycle. The other division are the trematodes, or flukes. They have flat or ovoid bodies, and they look more like this. The other group we were looking at are the nematodes, or roundworms. They're in the phylum Askelminthes. Nematodes, I think, is a much more favorable name. In contrast to the flatness that we see in the flatworms, these ones are round in body shape. They're long and cylindrical and unsegmented. Now, all of these worms can range from just a couple of millimeters to meters in length. Tapeworms have been found up to 25 meters in length. Again, we'll look at these in much more detail as we address the various systems that are infected by these parasites. But let's look at the general life cycle and reproduction of the helminths. It involves having a fertilized embryo or egg, a larval stage, and then an adult stage. In most species, the adult worm derives its nutrients from the host, as well as using the host to reproduce sexually. They must complete their life cycle by transmitting an infective form to a body of another host. So we have larval development, which occurs in an intermediate or secondary host. And then adulthood and mating occurs in the definitive or final host. Human infections come generally from contaminated soil, food, and water, or other infected animals. For example, a child might pick up roundworms from a cat or a dog that's contaminated in the household. It either requires oral intake or penetration of broken skin. There's a family of worms that are known for breaking through the skin in the bottom of the foot another creepy parasitic infection. In many of the helminth parasites we'll look at, humans are the definitive host. And thus, the organism has to leave their host to complete the life cycle. Let's take a quick look at that in more detail by looking at the pinworm. Contamination with the pinworm is called enterobiasis. This is when the person swallows the microscopic eggs. Often these eggs are picked up from another infected person by direct contact. Or it could be by touching articles an infected person has touched. The eggs will then hatch in the intestine. When they hatch, they release a larvae. And then it takes about one month for that larvae to become a mature adult worm. These worms can be anywhere from a millimeter to, to say 20 millimeters in length. The male and female worms will mate and then the female who is gravid containing all these eggs that you can see in the image here migrates out to the anus and deposits the eggs. This migration or movement around the anus causes itchiness. And of course, that itchiness is relieved by scratching, which ends up leaving eggs on the fingertips, and thus those fingertips can now transfer the eggs to another person. These eggs can either be spread to others, or they can be put back in the mouth of the original host who reinfects himself or herself. Pinworm infections are amazingly common. If you have a child, it's highly likely that that child could end up with pinworms at some point in their life. So watch out for that symptom of itchy butt. 
When we consider classification and identification of helminths, we look at shape, size, degree of development of various organs, the presence of hooks or suckers or other special structures for attachment, how they reproduced, what kinds of hosts they infect, and the appearance of the eggs and larvae. So the microscope is the predominant means of identifying and classifying any of the helminths we'll consider this semester. Parasitic worms have a huge distribution. There are about 50 species that are parasitic to humans, and they're distributed in all areas of the world. Many that were geographically restricted have acquired higher distribution areas because of jet travel and migrations. The yearly estimate of worldwide infections is in the billions, and it's not just confined to developing countries. The table below summarizes several of the important helminths we'll consider throughout this semester. Before we conclude this chapter, let's have a quick concept check. What group of helminths includes the roundworms? Is it flukes, nematodes, trematodes, or cestodes? Well, flukes we know are flat and are also known as trematodes, so we can take those both off the list. We know that cestodes are also flatworms, so that leaves us with the nematodes. So this concludes our chapter on eukaryotic microbes. Be sure to get started right away on your LearnSmart.